Good evening and good morning, actually, to some of our uh, guests joining us remotely from around the world. Um, I'm delighted. I'm Andrew Perchuk, the Deputy Director here at the Getty Research Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to Suzanne Lacey. Between feminism and social practice, I looked because the slide before said feminist performance and social practice, but uh, we've reduced the title. Um, I was going to give a proper introduction, but Suzanne said that was boring. So uh, I will just say that Suzanne Lacey is an artist that I've admired and whose work I've followed for more years than either one of us would like to admit. Um, and that, the, that she has been not only one of the most influential practitioners, but one of the most important and beloved teachers here in Los Angeles for many years. The subject uh, of today's thing is, I think, one of the most, follows two of the most important developments in post-World War II art, feminism and what came out of happenings in performance and turned into social justice, social practice. Um, so I am very excited to uh, hear the, the talk today. Um, first, let me acknowledge that I am standing on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielina and Tongva peoples. And then I will tell you that Suzanne will speak for about 35 minutes, and then we'll be joined by Glenn Phillips, our senior curator and head of exhibitions for a conversation. And without further ado, uh, it is my pleasure. Please join me in welcoming Suzanne Lacey. Thank you, Andy. That was definitely not boring. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, tonight about, um, I'm going to be talking about some ideas that uh, Andy was suggesting um, that, that I will be talking about. And I will also, and I did change the name to Feminist Performance, and I will also show you some of the latest um, work that I've been doing and what I've been thinking about. So I'm going to be uh, reading some of it because I want to make sure that uh, we get through this in a timely fashion. My practice is based on a pedagogy of questions, the aesthetic questions specific to visual arts, and the political questions needed to create an equitable public life. Each project begins with questions that guide the process, and each process is specific. Tonight, uh, specific in terms of its location, its audiences, its media surround, and its public relevance. Tonight, I'll briefly address my trajectory from early feminist performance art to my current work, work I consider both feminist and performative in its origins, although what I do now is often called social practice. In the Fresno Feminist Art Program, which is how I got into art, Judy Chicago used performance as a pedagogic device. Her ideas were part of that moment in the late 60s and early 70s during the formation of critical pedagogy. People like Paolo Freire, Herb Cole, and Henry Giroux. For Chicago, and that was the feminist art program, and this is Ablutions, a performance that Judy Aviva Romani, Sandra Orgel, and I did while we were at Cal Arts. For Chicago, art teaches, art advocates, art represents, art challenges. She shepherded countless students into the field and added feminist activism to the history of art. While at CalArts, I met Alan Capro. Capro had worked with Herb Cole, interestingly enough, and was himself engaged with pedagogy and the Carnegie Foundation, Project Otherwise, Other Ways, which he's written about for the first time in Mapping the Terrain, a new genre public art, 
uh, is such a project where he was exploring um, the ideas of teaching and education as an art form. He emphasized experience, intertwining ideas from John Dewey, Buddhism, anthropology, and sociology. I worked with Alan more than once uh, in a variety of ways. Basically, Alan um, was part of an, uh, a moment that we were all part of at CalArts at that time, the dematerialization of the art and the relocation from the object to the act. The emergence of feminist performance art, or of performance art, of public art, of new genre art, of environmental art, Chicano, black, feminist, and queer art all happened around the same time, in, in, at least in Los Angeles. What I drew from my relationship with him had to do with the questions of art, its relationship to life, the nature and meanings of experience, and the context for the artworks, the spatial, political, professional context. These were some of the same aesthetic and philosophical questions that led to performance and conceptual art. For example, in three weeks in May, one of the things I was interested in was directly related to Alan. The subject of, of violence against women, of course, is, uh, was directly from the, the kind of way in which Judy Chicago paved the way for us as feminists to use female experience. But in terms of Alan's thinking, um, the project was really, for me, based on not just the subject, but a series of questions about art itself. What is art? Three weeks in May was activities. We call it platforms or platforming today in art. It was framed by time and geography. Where does art take place? Capro famously said, any place but the museum. Who is an artist? The social movements at that time, which I think actually in California were a result of the Higher Education Act, which allowed working class people and people of color all to enter the art world with our masters around 1970 to 1972. But those social movements really expanded the idea of who could be an artist. And finally, who was art for? Through these processes, we began to develop strategies for inclusion, for media analysis, and so on. And I think Sherry Galky is probably right in the middle of this someplace, and and Anne, who are both, yeah, Ann Golden, who are both here in the audience. So media became an important part of that era's forms of analysis and uh, made its way into art. And this is um, the feminist, this is the KPFK, Helene Rosenbluth, interviewing uh, women of color about their experiences of rape. So another connector between social practice, so, so those are some ideas that come from social, come from the combination, at least in my practice, of Capro and Chicago, but also that era that I'm uh, discussing, but um, these connected to today's social practice. Another thing that's very fundamental to social practice is identity. Feminism was based in identity politics, the power that came from articulating hidden experiences and making the personal political. Feminist art was a project of reframing experiences based on gender, consciousness raising played a critical role reframing toward the um, goal of shaping new identities and resulting in a natural challenge to the public. This is a piece that's now at MoMA in New York and it's called I Tried Everything with uh, myself, Nancy Yodelman, Jan Lester, and Dory Atlantis. Prostitution Notes was a similar identity project, although in this case I was, it was not my identity per se, but it was an experience of women and trying to come to an understanding of it that is this piece is based on. In an era when mass change was seen as achievable on the hills of the civil rights movement, the inequities exposed through identity politics needed to be addressed. 
community organizing and coalition politics were much more strategies of feminism and feminist art in the 70s and 80s that is currently understood. These are strategies I still apply to my work, lots of talking, lots of communicating with different people, forming advisory committees like this one, and creating works cited in this case in the Roche Bouba Furniture Showroom with 18 different groups of women talking improvisationally about survival for an audience of about 1,500. Prostitutes, nuns, Judy Human from the disability rights movement in the movie Crip Camp is um, in this, organized this group. Women who had been institutionalized in mental asylums, women who were business women, And at the end, all of these women came together. There is a video on it. I'm not going to show it. Um, and began to talk simultaneously, and then one at a time had the mic for um, free testimonies. This is the piece as it's been reinstalled at the Queen's Museum right now. A lot of archival material accompanies this work. And this is a new iteration of freeze frame in the atrium, or the sunken living room. We're creating a living room where um, some of the convivial works that I've created are represented in various archives. And on the wall are quotes from friends, colleagues, and strategies of organizing. And this is being done in conjunction with a group of volunteer women who run the Cultural Food Pantry at Queens. And we are working to populate this with a series of activities. So these questions change, but circulate over and over again in my work. For example, Between the Door and the Street in 2013 addressed the question, what is feminism today? Feminism for me has never been about women only. From childhood, I've been deeply concerned with discrimination. The racism that I saw growing up, the farm worker strike, the volunteers in service to America where I challenged health inequities among the poor, Feminism is the analysis of and challenge to unequal power distribution. It shares much with other political movements, giving voice, analyzing inequity, and activation of an ex expanded public sphere. These two are fundamental projects of what is now called social practice. After freeze frame in 1982, fundamentally about people assigned female at birth, the questions in 2000s were quite different. What is the relationship between feminism and other forms of activism? What is an accurate recounting of global feminist history from the 70s? Who calls themselves feminists today? And about, um, I think it was 60 stoops with 360 women sitting on them in choreographed but um, uh, unrehearsed conversations, ending with a, um, a gathering in the street with all of the occupants of the houses. And I'll show you a brief couple of minutes of that piece. We're re-strategizing. Can you guys gather over here for a minute? We're going to talk about sweeping so, the way tape. And then we're going to slowly be kind of coming out, tablecloth, and then they're going to peel off to the right, walk all the way back. Down. I think they're doing something with women and poverty. That's what I believe. Yeah, so. feminism. Mm -hmm. no, no. about this project is how many of you have come together to construct it. This is a symbolic gesture. Whatever you feel, whatever you want to say, that is completely up to you. It was very like, he was like, still like very tough love, but very gentle with me. And like, oh, because you're a girl, you can cry. And that's okay, but now that I'm like, no daddy, I'm queer, and I don't really 
I embrace both genders. Right. It's like very like, oh, you don't need to cry. Like, suck that up, you know? <laughs> very like, it's more like life, I've been accustomed to hearing men say hi gorgeous and I say hi, I just know they're talking to me. He said hi gorgeous, my goddaughter said hi, I'm like what? <laughs> I'm middle aged now. Oh, I this is what you that. see on the news after there's a domestic violence homicide all the time. I had no idea. He seems so nice. It's because their issue is not anger management. It's power. It's control. Like, it's sometimes coercion. I should like asking my mom some things that I don't know. But maybe I cannot ask her because she don't know nothing about her. She didn't go to school. piece of me. I'm right. like, talk to me like I'm your daughter or your sister or your mother. Don't talk to me like I'm your next. What, do, what is something you want for your daughter's education? It could be the same. I wanted to assimilate so much and I wanted to blend in so the bad. of the victim isn't taken into account because then you're not tough on crime. Your body right. doesn't no, feel young, no, no. but your soul feels young. Oh, yeah. How do right. we bring right. to light right. the feminization of poverty? You know, it's not every day that we shut down our city blocks for things other than tube socks and Italian sausages. So to do something that really has a profound transformation of our individual lives and our collective lives, I think is very exciting for people. What you see here is the result of extensive relationships that at its fruition are these 400 people having a conversation. And so in many ways, the project's in some ways already finished by the time that the people come to see it. now because um, I want to discuss three projects that are clearly in the camp of social practice, but I said, uh, as I said, they are based on questions about the field for me. And uh, there's one in uh, Quito, Ecuador, Northwest England, and the Irish border, and I'm going to show you those three works. They're video and photographic based, but they began with performances. They're fairly large scale and months, if not years, in, um, in process. So I've pondered these questions before I began this work. What happens to art when we reframe it within non-art context? Is it still art? How can we represent a transient community practice after the effect after the fact in museums and galleries that prioritize visual representation and collectible objects, or should we do that? When does an accumulation of actions, meaning, and images become art, and when is it merely good politics? So I'm gonna show you these three works now and then how they have gone into yet another iteration of questions. This is Quito, Ecuador, and a project where women across the country, having nothing to do with me, wrote letters to, um, about their experiences of domestic violences. And these were collected in an archive, and I thought it was important to activate that archive. <clears throat> so I worked with um, Tim Kroger and other, a, a team of artists there who, in Tim's case, he began to do uh, with us workshop trainings for men on violence and masculinity, these men in this first three-day workshop would then go out and train other men until finally we ended up with about 300 men who were going to be participating in this performance. This is the director Q, crew at the uh, top level of a three-level. There's the performance space, well, you can see it here, the performance space, the audience space, and above the director space. And we worked for a year, over a year, a year and a half to um, uh, look at how men could, each man participating in the workshops and the performance received one of these letters that was specifically his letter. And he represented that letter both in the workshops in his life 
if he chose to, and then in this performance. So I'll show you uh, the performance, uh, a little section from the performance now. And um, tri trigger warning about violence. If you're triggered by violence, you may want to not look at this. Muchas personas dicen que sus recuerdos de infancia son los más bellos. Recuerdan sus juegos y alegrías. Mis recuerdos son diferentes. Cierta tarde, un hombre bonachón me dijo que me llevaría a tomar helados. Pero en vez de eso, me besó con fuerza. Me levantó la pequeña falda del uniforme e introdujo sus dedos en mí. Cuando yo tenía seis años, vi como mi papá pegó a mi hermano mayor. Le pegó tan fuerte que no pudo dormir en la noche del dolor que sentía de los golpes. Decía que tenía un hueso roto. Un día, la madre llegó temprano y observó a su esposo manoseando a su hijita pequeña. Ella no dijo nada por temor a perder a su marido o miedo de qué dirán. Yo me despertaba vomitando sangre. Me pegaba con correa militar. Me rompí el cuerpo a correazos. Cansada de tanto golpe, tomé veneno porque ya no soportaba más. Pero están dispuestos de ellos a trabajar, a mirarse en su propio dolor, en la historia de violencia del que ellos también fueron víctimas, y hacer algo. Los niños aún duermen. Espero que anoche no hayan oído los golpes secos que me diste para ahogar esa rabia que te inundaba. Porque tú lo dices siempre, sin ti no soy nada. Pero me pregunto, ¿qué soy yo a tu lado? Ya eran las 7 de la noche, hora en la que se supone que mi marido llegaba. Él había llegado borracho con sus amigos y me empezó a maltratar. Y entre todos me empezaron a tocar y luego a pegar. Cuando intenté tomar el teléfono, ya era muy tarde. Estaba siendo violada por los amigos de mi esposo. La primera bala la recibí en el estómago. Fue la única que pudo ser sustraída de mi cuerpo. La segunda bala. En este día, largo la dura no queden impunes. Me casé. Hace 54 años sufría maltrato verbal y físico durante todos estos años y ahora en mi vejez tuve el valor para dejarle. No importa quién es el receptor de una carta, cuando todos somos depositarios y autores de estas palabras que al juntarse, al significarse unas con otras, se encarnan y forman el cuerpo de hombres, niñas y mujeres. ¿Quién entonces se lleva la autoría de los cuerpos que cargan con toda esta violencia? El recuerdo es en carne viva. Está en mí. Está en mi cuerpo. Es lo que soy. Está en cada una de estas palabras. ¿Puedo leerte mi carta? ¿Te puedo leer mi carta? ¿Me permites leerte mi carta? So um, as you see in that, the audience, I mean, the performers moved into the audience and they began to read their individual letters to members of the audience. I want to move that. So that work was very powerful in its community and it was later transformed to have a different form in uh, the museum, which I won't be talking about today, but to say that's part of this project of authentic community work 
and authentic or impactful experiential work in a gallery, in a museum. This is uh, in Northwest England, the Circle in the Square, and it's a project that took two years to complete and is in a, uh, Northwest England's uh, very uh, poor at this point in time, working class community, deindustrialized. It did have a thriving textile industry that brought many Pakistani immigrants who were skilled workers in textile. But years later in the 90s, the area went through um, the, the, the textile industry transferred to, another, to other countries, and the mills all over this region are still abandoned. This particular one was about to undergo a renovation. Nobody had been in it for about 20 years, I think, that had lived and worked in the community. And one of the things that had happened in these mills was that Pakistani and, and uh, Christians worked together. And it was a place where for eight, 10 hours a day, they were in communication f with each other. I'm not saying that it was not a, you know, a, a perfect community, but it was a community where there was much um, relationship with each other. But after the mills closed, there was no real public space where Muslims and Christians would interact in that region. And uh, the threat of terrorism created uh, um, an even growing animosity. So in a small town called Briarfield with in situ um, and a group of agencies, we began planning a project that began with dinners, um, dinners with Pakistani and uh, immigrants and um, people who were, um, well, they, they aren't all immigrants. They're native born now, many of them in this region. But uh, basically white Christians and Pakistani Muslims coming together. We went to the mill, we uh, found mill workers and we interviewed them and we talked to them about racism and the future of the area and their work in the mills. We brought a friend of mine from Kentucky who did shape note um, singing to teach people in this community that we were building um, the, the shape note music where people sit in a square and um, our friends um, uh, in this particular Sufi group um, began to teach. They had already been teaching chanting, uh, dicker chanting. Um, and then three days after working together for a year, for three days we took over the mill and we opened it to tours for townspeople where a, um, a fiddler or a, or a dicker singer might show up, where there were interviews playing and where they could watch the film crew preparing for Saturday, the third day performance. And at that time, we also had a, um, at the end of that Saturday performance, we had a, um, a dinner for 500 people.
Thank you. Uh, finally, the last project in this series of three, that project that was in Pindle is um, in fact still operative. Threads of it, relationships are still operative today. It's probably the most successful project I've been involved with where, where the community really had the capacity to develop the relationships and the ideas that we initiated together. And finally, across in between, and I'm not gonna try to explain Brexit and the Irish border uh, in three minutes, but save to say that it's a long and complicated history and um, Northern Ireland, the, the history of Northern Ireland in Ireland. And uh, I was invited to do a project on the Irish border to deal with the subject of Brexit. And um, I worked with a crew of artists from Northern Ireland and Ireland, and uh, we did a project that's very complicated, took over a year, but in essence, uh, we, in Brexit, one of the big fears that was coming up was that a, a permanent border would be reconstructed in a place where the border at this point is very, very porous. And it would be reconstructed by the fact that Northern Ireland would stay in the EU and Ireland, I mean, excuse me, Ireland would stay in the EU and Northern Ireland would exit along with Britain uh, and UK. Uh, so we did a series of events where we tried to find the border. This is a group of kayakers trying to find the border in the middle of the, of the uh, lake. People who live on one side or the other, that actually is the border, that river. Horses and animals that don't know a border farmers trying to construct a border, and we flew drones overhead and we videoed this and made it into a video installation. And then we invited all of our colleagues to come to Stormont, which was closed at the time, and we hosted a conversation with about 120 people that went from the different meeting rooms into a final dinner, they, throughout this conversation, they formulated their goals for, a, um, for the border. And as border people, people who lived on borders, they created a manifesto. And we um, projected this onto the Ulster Museum. And this is a one minute video. So those are the three projects that belong in a group for me about community and, and the museum or the display world. In, um, uh, in November of last year, I opened an installation at um, 
Manchester Art Gallery and at the uh, Whitworth Gallery, two galleries managed by the same director, Alistair Hudson. And this body of work that I've been thinking about in the last year or two has been uh, whether or not art can change institutions. And in three different um, museums, I've been working very closely with the directors and the uh, curators to think through a project that is both an artwork and a museum program that is ongoing. I know we aspire to that as social practice artists, and this is a real investment of energy on all of our parts here in Moscow and in, um, in um, upstate New York, in New York, uh, to try to look at how uh, you could pull, in this case, what are the strategies that we could pull from these four installations? This co social cohesion is from the Circle and the Square project. So we have an installation and we had an opening that brought a busload of people from Briar Field. And we continue to work with people in this community and they use this installation in the museum to present to their um, political people, people they're trying to seek support from. There's a Nasheed Boys Choir. There's a lot of things that have continued from this project. So in, in uh, just recently, I was in Manchester and we had four days of events and one was on social cohesion, one was on youth agency, and this was extracted from a much older work they also installed called the Oakland Projects, where I worked with teenagers, police, teachers, various people to look at uh, the experience of young people in the city of Oakland. And this is the installation that is at the Whitworth. And we've used this uh, project, we've extracted strategies to do projects with teenagers and uh, in, in the exhibition space, we've convened um, a, a lot of activists who are working with youth development. This is Borders, and um, we did talk about the Irish border. There's a lot of Irish people that live in Manchester, um, but this is the installation. And these are photographs of people who attended the dinner, the three-screen installation. And one of the topics that we dealt with on the issue of borders is the border of um, uh, gender identification and sexual identification. This is a tour we took through the city to see um, and ended up in what's called the gay, I think it's the gay quarter or the gay section uh, at any rate in Manchester. And then finally, uh, we, the, a new work that I've been working on for over a year during COVID with about 15 older women uh, dealing with the issue of work and intersectional issues. We started about two years ago working every Wednesday morning with a group of uh, the advisory group. We then went out and interviewed 100 women and we installed in the museum um, an interview booth. These are some of the women from the advisory group. And then the interviews were transcribed and anonymized and they were put on the wall of the installation. And we then began to present the information that we're extracting from um, these interviews led by these two researchers from University of Manchester and um, the uh, Metropolitan Manchester Met. And these are the women from the advisory group who are on the extraction of data and analysis of data team. And uh, then we invited the 100 women to dinner. And that was um, the, the grand finale of the four days of the what kind of city. So I'll stop at 6.40 and invite Glenn to come up. Okay, can everyone hear us? 
Wow, I can't see any of you. I just see lights in my face. Yeah, <laughs> you could raise the house lights a little bit uh, if, if you could. Thank you. So. Uh, Suzanne, thanks so much for that. I have a, a lot of things I want to ask you about, but I think I want to, well, first of all, thank everyone in the audience for coming. Uh, and also thank everyone who is joining us online. Um, but, you know, I, I want to pick up from the sort of line of thought that you started with those last few projects of thinking about what it means to be working within a community to create an artwork, and then what it means to take that project and put it into the museum. And, and you're mentioning all these projects sometimes that are going on for years. And so I maybe want to start by stepping back a little bit and, and ask you some logistical questions. Mm -hmm. I've worked with you on a project before, so I know that you are immensely organized mm -hmm. and, and, you know, plot things out, map them, draw them. Uh, every little detail is there. But w can we talk about at the beginning of a project? Let's just say uh, when you've maybe identified a potential community that you want to work with. Could you talk about how that starts? Well, I think, you know, it, it almost always starts with an invitation. After L.A. and Oakland, where I lived, um, most of my work is done in another city, and it's done with and through an invitation. So sometimes when people invite me, they have an idea of what they want me to do. Like in Quito, I really didn't want to do another project on violence against women. I've done many since the 70s. And um, I, uh, but I, you know, I'm invited for a reason. And so I agreed that I would do something and, um, on that issue. And so the first thing I do is, is sometimes there's not an issue, like there wasn't in a Briar Field. Um, but no matter, I talk to a lot of people. I, in Ecuador, we had teams of, uh, groups of people. We would invite 20 people to a session, and we'd sit around talking about violence against women, what they thought was a good idea, not a good idea, and what were some of the issues and the complexities of that area. I do a, a systems analysis, so I know where some of the power brokers are and the spokespeople and the, everybody from universities to grassroots organizations. And, um, and then I think with people, then I form teams. And it's critical in this kind of work. I mean, I don't do any of this work alone. And in fact, this isn't, these aren't my brilliant ideas. These are ideas that have been extricated from group processes. And sometimes it's my idea or I might have a, a piece of an idea like, wow, you guys sit on stoops and then somebody else will bring another piece to the puzzle, like the between the door and the street. So I do a lot of building of groups, and I'm also very um, rigorous about making sure that there's diverse representation in the groups, particularly like the, the project recently in, um, in England the, that I was, I was rigorous about. If we have 15 people, you know, they better be mostly people of color, and they better represent you know, we, we I basically analyze who lives in this town, what kind of people, what kind of populations, and uh, and then we recruit based on people's, um, in this case, age, gender, and identity of origin. I guess there's a lot of Afro-Caribbeans, a lot of Africans there, a lot of Middle Eastern people, and I think the strength of that project is twofold. It's quite seriously a research project that will have legs. It does have legs already. And secondly, it's just amazingly diverse. Um, so, so those would be the key things that I think I do when I come into a town. And so then through this back and forth of speaking with lots and lots of people, maybe engaging with local groups also or nonprofits, then the a lot of these projects seem to have like a culminating performance or, or a really large moment that, that uh, happens. As that idea takes shape, do you discuss that with everyone as well uh, so that you, you, you feel the entire team? It's not always entire teams. Sometimes mm -hmm. in Ecuador there were multiple teams. Mm -hmm. There was, you know, the research team, the um, artistic team, and, and um, 
they were, so, so basically not everybody makes all the decisions, mm -hmm. but the decisions are fairly broadly shared. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I make decisions by myself mm. in any way. And at that point, when, when the sort of major performative component happens, do you ever feel that the, the project has completed, at least in a way, or, or is it not finished until there's then a, a, an exhibition potential that might happen at an arts institution? I think as a visual person, I'm, I've always been interested in the, uh, first, the spectacle of seeing something take place, like the crystal quilt. It was sort of at the end when everybody rushed in. It was like it went from a formal Amish quilt designed by Miriam Shapiro to this crazy quilt of color. So there's a lot of visual pleasure for me in that. But then um, I, I like the photos and I like thinking about how it has another shape. And that shape could be anything from a, a television program to a, a, a newspaper to a museum. Mm -hmm. And for me, they're, I, I wouldn't say they're all equal, but they are forms of, and the community, and the conversation that goes on in the community, and each of those is venues for a different form of communication that's mm -hmm. necessitated by the constraints of the venue. Mm -hmm. And I think the spectacle aspect is not in all my works, I just didn't show those. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a lot of things that aren't. Prostitution nuts wasn't spectacle, mm -hmm. and a lot of ones you don't know. Yeah. But but there is something I like about that kind of accumulation of bodies in the environment or in physical spaces mm -hmm. that I find very powerful visually. Yeah, well, and as you know, I, I feel this is one of the aspects of your work that isn't discussed enough, maybe, like we're talking about between feminism and, and social practice, but I, I always think of you as, as between conceptual art and video art in, in a way that, you know, you're using all of these tools uh, that are maybe more abstract in some sense. Uh, there's this interesting thing that happens that, uh, you know, when, when you add content into a piece, into a conceptual piece. There could have been a reality out there where that means conceptual art has become more broad, uh, but instead you get narrowed down and, and you know, you're seen only in, in the box of, of feminist art or something else. But uh, you know, throughout your work, uh, you've, you've been so freely taking tools from many different uh, strategies of art making. Because um, I don't know how to draw. Because you don't. <laughs> but it, you know, even I watching the video from across and in between, you know, pulling from land art, pulling from all of these other disciplines, and uh, the ability to uh, translate the piece into another visual language that might be more common in a museum. What's the question in that? Well, I, I guess I'm asking you to, to respond to that idea or say a little bit well, more about how you, but, how you adapt to but a museum But there's another question in there, I think, that mm -hmm. you started with and that I want to comment on because I think it's very important politically, mm -hmm. and that is that um, it's been true since the dawn of civilization that women are uh, deal with content or subject and men deal with the great practice of formal innovation and uh, you'll, you'll have most women are very annoyed with that that are making art just like black artists are very annoyed with that. There are aspects like in freeze frame of one's identity that you're proud of and that are they serve a purpose to, to make that identification and that purpose is usually political. So I think that um, that I do come from an era when with and people like Capra where all materials were available and all ideas were available and we sort of mushed them together into a, a much more interdisciplinary way of working. I think that for me, so that's the first, you know, the thing about how you get boxed into conceptualism versus, I think I remember a, somebody like Paula Harper saying in art history at Cal Arts that Marie Lorenzen was considered um, a woman who made paintings about babies or something. And um, so I think that, um, that that's the politics of the negative aspects of identity politics. Like I said, I think there are positive aspects because it calls attentions to certain kinds of oppressions and discriminations. But the second part is, do I think about that or what is that transition? 
Well, I, I'm thinking, for instance, I, I remember a story you told me one time for a, a, a group show that you were in, and they said, okay, so you're going to have this much wall right. space. Pompidou. And you said, okay, well, then how tall can I go? And, and that's, that's speaking, there's this great malleability in, in your works. It's not, you know, some artists, even if it's a big installation piece, there's going to be a sheet of instructions, and this is the size the projection always is, and it's always in this relation, and you can follow the instructions, and then you always get the exact piece. But when I see your pieces, you know, you completely adapt them to the space Welcome that you're in. Welcome to my new world. <laughs> um, basically, that is a strategy that came out of the era I came out of, and an environment like Los Angeles that was not particularly part of the art market. So we reconfigured, and we were experimenting. We reconfigured performative activities in a variety of ways. You know, black and white photograph thumbtack to a wall, or uh, accoutrements of the performance left over, that sort of thing. And after a while, I began to, recently actually, not, not all that long ago, I began to realize that that while I might be malleable, what that meant was, uh, and I'm interested in forms of communication, so what does it look like if it's black and white or if it's giant color? But since the 90s, first off, the focus on the market, and secondly, the scale of spectacle that occurs inside museums is, um, has transformed our attention, you know, the way attention is delivered, and I like visual spectacle, I simply now can d demand a three-screen projection, mm -hmm. whereas it probably wouldn't have even occurred to me to think about it in 1980, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think that um, that's really a response to the changing forms of art and the possibilities of art. Mm -hmm. And for me, it fulfills, um, again, visual pleasure. What sort of responses uh, have you seen from the participants in your pieces when they then see it turned into, you know, a, a quite spectacular installation? Well, first off, they're almost always part of it. Mm -hmm. So they see it, like in the circle in the square, they, I had people vetting it all along the way I took things, but they don't see it on that scale. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, but there's, you know, but they might see it first when it's at that scale. I still have a lot of relationships in these communities that that I, um, uh, you know, continue to enjoy, and and um, but I I, I don't want to say too much about that because I think that's sort of hubristic. Mm -hmm. Oh, they were so amazed that they laughed and applauded and cried and, you know, I mean I know the people in Briarfield and Pendle have been really um, uh, attentive to what that work does for them, mm -hmm. both in terms of grant applications, they've got a ton of money mm -hmm. from our work together, in terms of the strategies and relationships. There are a lot of them are working together, continuing to work. I mean, they're, they're now doing this entire uh, strip of development along the canals, not, not because of me, but because we all work together on this project. And um, the, um, they have been using it. They bring their imam in, they bring, who blessed it. <laughs> they were so excited. Um, they, they bring their, um, uh, you know, their spiritual imam, and they bring their council people in to say, hey, you need to pay attention to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. They being a, a group of probably 50, 40, 40 people that are sort of the gang working there. Mm -hmm. So people think differently about it. I'm sure there are people that don't like some of, some of the way it looks. Mm -hmm. And is that often a, a, a strategy for you when you're making works that in addition to, say, a public audience that you want to reach, that, that there's also, uh, this is a way to get attention to an, to an issue, to a problem in the media, or to get coverage, or to bring it to the attention of a, of a politician. That's, that's part of your strategy. It is, but again, it has to do with who I'm, where I'm speaking. So I, I'm not really appreciative of newspaper articles that talk about me and my work. I'm appreciative of newspaper articles that use the issue mm -hmm. 
to discuss, you know, newspaper, that's mass media. Mm -hmm. But in an art magazine, I'm very happy to have the art considered as art. Mm -hmm. So in, in a museum, that's not really the primary place I think that social change takes place. Maybe it does, but over decades, right? So it's in the popular culture, in electoral media, in communities around organizing, that has, a, that has a prioritization for me of the subject, usually. Mm -hmm. And then the art world is where I talk about how it's art, mm -hmm. through writing or through exhibitions. I'm not sure where we are on time. Are, are we, can we ask questions, can we take questions? Yeah, so uh, we're happy to take questions from the audience, and is there a way that, that people can submit questions on Zoom also? So I guess using the, the Q&A function on Zoom. I'll start with some questions that are coming in from Zoom. So um, this one is about labor, so this is the question. Who is being paid while the work is being created? A lot of labor goes into the creation of these pieces. Many of the workers are women. Culturally, women have been expected to give their time to many projects and productions. How do you deal with this issue? Are the workers paid? If not, how is it determined who is paid and who is not? Yeah, um, workers are paid. It depends on at what level. If a project involves 500 people, they're not all paid. Um, the budget don't allow that, but I'd like to point out that I don't get very much. I definitely don't make a living on my work. Um, I don't, in fact, I work full time as a professor in order to make the money to do my work. Um, but um, I think those, those questions are really, really critical and they're different, well, I keep looking at you, and they're different in different cultures. Um, in Ecuador, it means one thing in Queens, it means another. Um, and um, nobody has to work, but there is a lot of volunteer labor. There was more earlier than there is now. Um, but I, I don't know, maybe even people in the audience have more specifics, or does that answer that question? I'm not fond of Zoom because you can't address people. Does anybody else in the audience have a question? in our quiet little socially distanced audience in the back. Uh, could you come down to the micro microphone so that um, our, our viewers on Zoom can hear as well? Can, is there a microphone in the back we could take? How are the projects financed? Okay, that's, that's a good point. How are the projects financed? Um, usually through grants. Um, for the most part, I don't, have, I don't have a gallery and so I don't have a collecting base. So I don't make money from the projects. Um, I mean, in, in terms of a way to make a living. So it's usually at this point, well at this point it's almost always a grant or grants. Thanks, Suzanne, so much for this talk. It was just fascinating and I know we are all kind of processing it. I had a question um, about kind of, uh, maybe this is a little personal as well, but um, you know, so much of your practice, well, your, your practice in art making as well as social practice is based on community building in a lot of ways and connecting to issues of concern with a community. And so much of it seems to really um, depend on sort of that physical contact with communities. So I'm wondering about your experience through the pandemic and how, particularly in terms of the context of between uh, feminism, that also really affected women in um, many, I mean, it affected all of us, but it has especially impacted women. So I wondered if you could comment a bit on that. Well, that, that I was fortunate to retain my job through COVID um, as a teacher. And so um, I didn't suffer. I suffered economically, of course, um, with different kinds of things that happened at the university, but also um, with the loss of a lot of revenue from shows and things. Um, but, well, I wouldn't say a lot of revenue, with a lot of shows. So I guess that's a form of economic uh, problem. But um, in, Care has obviously emerged, and I'm glad for that, through COVID. 
The fact that women are the caretakers and don't get paid the same for work is something I've been aware of since I was a child, so there's nothing super new that's emerged uh, for me, but the project in England is a really good example of, uh, you know, if, you, if I rely a lot on my personal presence with people and my going back and back and back and spending time and, you know, knowing people, and they actually become my friends, my relationships, not everybody I work with, but, but you know, key people in every project. And, um, like, I was going to say something about Moscow, but I won't yet. Um, like, the, the women in England, I, I thought, is there any way they're going to like this, you know, they're going to ever have any trust in this white lady over in California who talks to them first thing in the morning when it's their evening? And um, after meeting with them every single week, I mean, I'm more consistent with those women than I am with uh, my family. Um, I, every single week on Wednesday morning, we met for over a year. And now it's, it's uh, a few Wednesdays. And I went there twice during the pandemic. So, so those relationships of trust is, it, it takes longer to build online um, that whole work is about care. That work is about the, it started with the retirement age in, in England that had suddenly gone from 62 to 65 for women, meaning there was a gap. If you had planned to stop work at 62, you didn't have any income coming in until 65 when, when their uh, benefits kick in, such as they are. And a lot of the women I'm working with are immigrants or they're women um, who are, um, have dropped their professions of architecture to come. So work and taking care of each other and themselves is, is, is the topic of that project. Um, so that's what I'd have to say about that. Sherry? Um, yeah, this is about issues and um, you'd like to work in and places you'd like to work in. I mean, sometimes you take on an issue you're interested in, like violence against women, and sometimes you go to a place and sort of suss out what the issue would be there. And if you could have anything you wanted, what is there an issue that you'd really like to take on, uh, or is there a place you'd really like to go to work? If you could have anything, Suzanne Lacey. I mean, there's a set category of things that I'm capable of dealing with. And a, not every place can I deal with those same things. I would not do um, the Oakland projects in the United States now. There's no reason. Uh, it's not the right time for me as a white woman. In the early 90s, I thought in Oakland, a very diverse city, working with lots and lots of collaborators of different ethnicities, it was okay, not for everybody, but it was okay for me. I, I wouldn't do that project now. This is the wrong time and place for that project, for me. Um, but I have a set category of things that I work on, and they are, like I've been trying to do a project in Oslo for five years, and I can't figure out where the discrimination is. I know it's there, but, but it's not as in your face as, as it is so for me, the issues are, are race discrimination, since that's the earliest one. The last one, and, and then gender discrimination and um, you know sexual preference and other kinds of discriminations. Labor is very important, and it's a theme that runs through my work. And I guess the last one is um, uh, class. It takes us a while to figure out class here in this country. So those. I can't deal with other things. I don't know what else I would want to do than that. Hello. Oh, that was close. Hey, Regiment Kimley, nice to meet you. Um, I was interested in, I was exposed to your work a while back, and I was interested in your process, especially early on, of organizing your work that was coming from the community space into somehow it could be understood in the art space, gallery space, museum space, and doing that crossover in the sense of a community organizer now somehow existing in this world. Um, that was an extensive conversation I had for like a, like two hours um, and trying to figure out as an ex-community organizer myself, who's now an artist, 
how do I kind of like demonstrate the work I've done there through this lens, specifically from an organizational logistical standpoint. And I've been all over your website, so now I can actually talk to you. So that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Reginald McKinley. Reginald, hi. Yes. Um, so um, I think in the last, I would say with the advent of the ideas of social practice, people have been a lot more aware of how important community organizing is. In the beginning, they weren't, and artists couldn't organize their way out of a paper bag, you know, basically. And, you know, you put them in a studio with four white walls for five years, and then they're supposed to come out and deal with social issues. That's kind of strange. I, I had a very different background. I wasn't trained in that way as an artist. So I can sympathize uh, with where you're at. I, I guess the question I would ask is, why do you want to? Um, why would one want to do that? I don't think the art art is cultural practice, like the way Patrice Cullors do it, does it, or Hank Willis Thomas. Cultural practices are really powerful politically, but art galleries and museums not so much. So I think the first thing you have to ask is, you know, why do you why do you want to do that? And then if the answer is, yeah, I want to you need to hang out with a lot of artists and start understanding what that world is. Now, you might already do that, I don't know. But um, that's as much as I could say about that. I do teach stu uh, students who are coming from both a political perspective or an aesthetic perspective into the arts at a, at a graduate level. So um, it's an important question. I think that uh, we are out of time now, or maybe even a little bit over time. So Suzanne, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you again, everyone who joined us in person and online. And yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks very much.